invite you to open your Old Testament to the book of Exodus, please. Exodus in chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the first 10 verses of Exodus chapter 2 today. Does anyone play the trumpet here? Nobody. Trombone? Anything? No? A little bit. Trumpet, uh, the sound a trumpet makes, we've all heard trumpets, it's, it's loud, it's, it's clear, it's piercing. There's a reason why trumpets were used on the ancient battlefield, because it could pierce through the chaos and the tumult of the battle. But sometimes if a trumpeter is in maybe like a, an orchestra or a, a band, a jazz band or something like that, they'll use something called a mute You've seen these before. They look a little bit like a plunger, and they're held over the bell of the horn to kind of suppress that clear, piercing noise, and they can modulate that sound to go with, you know, the orchestra or whatever song that they're, they're playing. There are times when God is a bit like that. He's there. He's active, he's at work, but his presence and his activity aren't immediately obvious. Let's look at the context of this passage. I think this is one of those places where God's providence and his presence is muted. The context in chapter 1, to set things up, is very sinister. In verse 8 of Exodus 1, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. Verse 13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And then finally in verse 22 of chapter 1, Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So the Egyptians here are told to drown every Hebrew baby boy in the Nile River. And it's against this very dark background of Pharaoh's own form of genocide and infanticide where God's providence shines for us in chapter 2. What is providence? Well, let's give it a very informal definition here. Providence is how God puts it all together for the good of his people. How he is able to direct events to accomplish his own good purposes for his glory. And we see God's providence at work in Exodus chapter 2. I want to notice four things about providence, and the first one is the restraint of God's providence. Could we look at verses 1 and 2 together? Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Now, it's a little strange here, if you read on down through this passage, that nobody is named in this whole section except for Moses. The father is mentioned, but he's not named. The mother is mentioned. She's not named. The sister is mentioned. She's not named. Not even Pharaoh's daughter here is given a name. So the author is intentionally leaving out some details to highlight what's really important. Now what's even more 
God isn't specifically mentioned in this passage. God's name isn't in the text. But those of you who have already read this story, you know what's coming. You know that God is there. He's in the text. His activity is there, but it's restrained. It's muted. Do you know who John Witherspoon was? John Witherspoon was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And he was the president of the College of New Jersey, which is now known as Princeton, in the 1700s. John Winston, he lived in a place called Rocky Hill that was about two miles away from the college that he worked at. And so his commute from Rocky Hill would take him down the same road every single day from his house to his office. Well, one day, he was in his study at the college when his neighbor from Rocky Hill, who lived next door, came bursting into his office and he said, Dr. Witherspoon, you must join with me in giving praise to God for his outstanding providence. I was on my way down here when my horse got spooked and ran away, and my carriage was smashed against the rocks, and I escaped unharmed. And Mr. Witherspoon said, oh, I can tell you a far more remarkable providence than that. I've driven down that road hundreds of times. My horse has never ran away. My buggy has never been smashed. I've never been harmed. Could we make an application here? That God is at work in the mundane as well as in the extraordinary. I think that's something that at least I tend to forget. Do you tend to forget this? We tend to think that God is at work in our lives, and when God is at work in our lives, we're going to be able to really see it. There's going to be some fireworks. There's going to be something sensational that's going to happen, a great breakthrough. When our car is totaled and we walk away with one little scratch on our arm, what do we say? We say, God protected me. God must have been watching out for me. Praise God, because we know that God was there. Perhaps, yes, but what about the 10,000 other times when you drove somewhere and you made it back home to your family safe and sound? We may have some catching up to do with the Lord in Thanksgiving, brothers and sisters. Every single day, we need to appreciate the restraint of God's providence. God is just as powerfully at work in our everyday lives to provide rain from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying our hearts with food and gladness, as Paul said in Acts 13. God provides life and breath and everything. You got up today. You got dressed today. You're healthy enough to be here today. Praise God for his providence. He's at work in the mundane activities of everyday life, of serving your kids, cleaning up the house, being respectful at the office, having a good attitude, forgiving somebody, showing patience, showing gratitude, visiting somebody, a text message, an email, a phone call, a cup of cold water, if you're doing it for him. He is at work in you. The restraint of God's providence. Second of all, let's look at the suspense of God's providence. Back in our text, verses, let's look at verses 3 and 4 for now. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with pitchumen. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Okay. So Moses' mother must have known she couldn't hide the baby forever. 
Sooner or later, it's going to be obvious. And so her plan is, even though it was a risky plan, even though it was a dangerous plan, seems to be premeditated, very carefully thought out. Now, this isn't in the text here. This is off to the side. This is my opinion. But she could have known that Pharaoh's daughter routinely bathed in this part of the river. We don't know that. That's my opinion. But we do know that the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. So she could have counted on the pagan belief that if the baby were found protected in the reeds of the Nile River, it was a work of the gods, and therefore Pharaoh's daughter couldn't in all good conscience abandon it. Again, we don't know for sure. That's not in the text. It's just a hunch. It's just a perhaps. It's a could be. But I want you to notice how the tension increases in the middle of the story. Verse 5 and 6. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Do you notice in verses 3 to 6, the text zooms in on every little detail as a way to increase the suspense of the story because this is the crucial moment. The sister is over there. She's looking on from a distance. And what Pharaoh's daughter does at this moment determines the future. God's cause seems to be so fragile. It seems to be hanging by a thread. And whatever this woman does next, Israel's future, God's promises, the coming Messiah, our salvation, it hangs in the balance. Then she takes pity on the boy. And the rest is history. Again, could we make another application to say that God isn't boring? We can trace this kind of narrative arc through many stories in the scripture and through the whole biblical narrative as a whole. When things look bad, when they look really tense, something happens that changes everything. Many stories in the Bible follow that same dramatic pattern. In the book of Kings, Athaliah, kills the entire royal family, it seems, and God's promises to David seem to be lost. Except there's one faithful woman who sheltered this, this, this innocent baby. Jehoshaphat hides the baby in the temple. For seven years, Joash grows up and the doors are open and he's crowned as king at age seven and God's promise is preserved. Or how about God's people in exile in Babylon? They learn, they get the, the news, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. All hope is lost, they thought. God has abandoned us here to this, to this pagan nation to be enslaved forever. We're never going to get back home. That's it. But they were mistaken. God fulfilled his promise of redemption. He, he calls forth Caesar or Osiris, the, the, the Persian, and he releases them back home. Or, of course, the greatest tension in all of Scripture is the moment when Christ hung on the cross. Jesus, who embodied all of the promises of God, and it looked like the greatest failure. It looked like all of the hopes were dashed and looked like the devil had won and God was defeated. But there, of course, was more happening on the cross than we could see. And what looked like God's ultimate defeat was really God's ultimate victory over evil. What I mean to say is this, God keeps things interesting. There is not an iota of tedium in his being. You and I have often found God to be hard to understand, maybe frustrating or challenging, but we can never say, we can never accuse God of being boring. Is God boring to you? Is the Christian faith boring to you? 
Are these songs about God boring to you? If God is boring to you, I want to suggest to you that you're not worshiping the God of the Bible, the God who revealed himself in Jesus Christ, the God that we serve. He's so unexpected. He's so surprising. He's so exciting. And we should be swept up in that wonder every time we approach him in prayer, every time that we worship him. And we should also know that during those times of tension and suspense in our lives, that God, who is not boring, is at work in his providence. The suspense of God's providence. Number three, the humor of God's providence. Do you know that God has a sense of humor? He sure does. Verse 7, verse 7 to 9. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. There's humor in Scripture. And unless you're one of those Christians who drinks vinegar for breakfast, you probably have found certain things very funny in your daily Bible reading. And you can maybe find yourself chuckling as you read certain things in the Bible. Well, the Jews who were reading this story, they would have certainly found this hilarious. Think about it. Pharaoh, what does he want to do? Chapter 1, he wants to wipe out Israel. He wants to keep them slaves. He wants to wipe out all these Hebrew baby boys. And who is it who prevents Pharaoh from doing this? Well, it's Pharaoh's own daughter. And not only that, but the baby is returned to his own mother. And not only that, but she gets a government check for providing child care to her own child. And not only that, but she does it now under state protection. That's funny. Now, the Israelites would have appreciated that humor and that irony. But, you know, whenever there is humor in the Bible, it's usually because there's a serious point to be made. There's a dark side to the humor in this story. These ironic twists show how easily God makes doofuses out of tyrants and despots like Pharaoh who love to boast in their own power, who think they're so wise, who love to flex their muscles by grinding God's people beneath their feet. And how easily God nullifies their decrees when he plays one of his jokes on them. And of course, the greatest joke of all is Satan, who thought that he could frustrate God's plans by inciting Judas and the wicked crowds and the Romans to crucify Jesus. But Jesus turned Satan's greatest weapon, sin and death, against him on the cross and made a fool out of him. Though the Lord looked like he was disarmed and publicly humiliated, and triumphed over on the cross, Paul could see that God was the one disarming the rulers and authorities, putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. It's not always a ha-ha kind of funny. It's a strange kind of funny too, isn't it? God's irony is always good news to his suffering people. When we see the humor of God's providence, it can make us laugh again. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked back in your life and in the moment when you're going through something, you're not laughing because it's really a struggle for you. But then you look back and you laugh and say, if only I would have known what God was doing. If only I would have known that this is the path that would get me here. And it's okay to laugh. It helps us to see who's really in charge. And it puts our own fears into perspective. Here's mighty King Nebuchadnezzar. 
who stormed Jerusalem, who destroyed the temple. And what is he doing? Oh, he's out in the field eating grass like an animal because he doesn't acknowledge God's lordship over the kingdoms of men. That's funny. So why then, if this is the God that we serve, who can bring down nations, who can drown Pharaoh in the water, who can make Nebuchadnezzar eat grass, why should we fear men who only have the power to kill the body? Oh, really, that's all that they can do? Anybody can do that. I think this is what Jesus is saying. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Yes, the nations, they rage, and the people, they plot in vain. And the kings and the rulers of the earth, they set themselves against the Lord's anointed, against Jesus and his kingdom. But their efforts are so pathetic from God's vantage point that he holds them in derision. He laughs in heaven. You think you can go toe-to-toe with the creator of the universe? God laughs when the axe boasts against the one who wields it. God laughs when the clay tries to talk back to the potter. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our king, he won by losing. He lived through dying. He crushed the serpent by being bitten. God's irony is always good news to his suffering people. And lastly, number four, the difficulty of God's providence. The difficulty of God's providence. Verse three, I'm not going to read that one again because it got me in trouble before, but uh, you see the word basket there? Again in verse 5, basket. Well, the ESV translated as basket, you might have a different word there, but the only other time, the only other time that this particular Hebrew word is used in the entire Old Testament is in reference, can you guess, to Noah's ark. Noah's Ark. Now that Ark, of course, was huge in comparison, but the same term is used here to describe a waterproof basket that the infant Moses was placed in. What does that tell us? Whenever you see an obscure term like this that only occurs in one other place in the Bible, it's kind of hard to imagine that the author isn't deliberately trying to connect the two things. Noah's ark was a vehicle of deliverance for Noah and his family and the animals, and this ark would be the vehicle of deliverance as well, but not only for Moses, but the entire nation of Israel and the future of the world. Verse 10, verse 10. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Moses, Moshe in Hebrew, sounds like the verb to draw out. Moshe, Moshe, Moshe. And so it's a play on words there. But you notice here, Moses is spared. But there's a problem. Remember what we read at the end of chapter 1 and verse 22? Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile. What about all those other Hebrew baby boys who were not spared? You know, what we might be tempted to do in a lesson like this is look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 and say, wow, isn't God's providence in sparing Moses wonderful? And yes, it is. Amen. Absolutely. But don't forget that chapter 1 indicates that others were not spared. That there were many others who were torn away from their arms of their fathers and their mothers, and they were thrown into the Nile River, and they were drowned, and against all their parents' best efforts to keep them safe. One is spared. How many others were not spared? 
And this is something we need to keep in mind with providence. God's providence is both marvelous and mysterious. Herod the Great in the New Testament. He is the New Testament equivalent to Pharaoh. Remember, he got wind by the, the Magi from the east that there was a great king that was going to be born, and he felt threatened by this king. And he wanted to kill all the male children in Bethlehem. You remember that story, Matthew chapter 2. But the angel, of course, warns Joseph, and the family escapes into Egypt, and the infant Jesus is spared from the tyrant Herod. Sounds familiar, right? Very similar kind of story. What marvelous providence. Yes, amen. But what about all the other parents in Bethlehem? How many funerals took place? How many graves were dug? How many broken hearts? A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. You know, we're confronted with these difficulties throughout Scripture. God's providence is marvelous, but it's also mysterious, and sometimes it's hard for us to deal with. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is thrown into prison by Herod Agrippa, a different Herod. And the church is, is fervently praying for Peter. And God sends his angel to rescue Peter and answers that prayer. But then James, in the same chapter, is executed with the sword. Not to mention the sentries who guarded Peter were executed as well. Why was Peter saved and James executed? Well, the Bible doesn't avoid these questions, but it confronts us with them, that this is the reality of God's providence. As if God is trying to say to each one of us today, look, I don't want you to think that I'm going to spare you from every single pain and discomfort and every single dangerous circumstance. We have to have the same attitude as Daniel's three friends who stayed faithful to God no matter what. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And they answered the king. The king told them to bow down and worship the statue. And they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We actually don't answer to you. We answer to our Lord. If this be so, if you're going to chuck us in this furnace, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, if in God's mysterious providence, in his own plan, he doesn't see fit to do that, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. We're going to do the right thing no matter what God chooses to do. God does not always deliver every servant from every distress. But God will always act in sufficient measure to preserve his purposes, to preserve his kingdom. It doesn't promise you and I our own individual Moses-like experience. And so this passage doesn't teach that you're never going to suffer, that you're never going to have to even die for God's kingdom, but rather that God and his kingdom will never die. And that's still good news because we're part of that kingdom. And we believe in the resurrection. God's people are like that, that burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, always enduring trials, but never quite consumed by them. And so the vital question is not whether you're immune to suffering, but whether you have a Savior into whose hands you can commit your life. And we who are in Christ have such a Savior. And into his hands we commit our spirit because Jesus Christ has redeemed us. Brethren, we should be able to rest in God's providence. And let's recognize the restraint of that providence from time to time. That it is suspenseful at times. That there is a dark humor to it and that it's good news to us. But also let's recognize the difficulty of God's providence, knowing that through life's joys and life's trials, God is at work shaping 
and conforming us to the image of his beloved son as we trust and obey him. Ours is not to know what's coming, not to know every step God is going to take. Ours is to trust and obey God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I appreciate your attention and I appreciate your recovery from that blunder earlier. And I hope that this isn't, that's not the only thing you remember from this sermon. But let's all remember God is providentially at work in our lives as we trust and obey him. And there might be someone here who needs the forgiveness of God and it's yours in Jesus Christ. And you can have it if you give your life over to him and you repent of your sins. And if you haven't been baptized, we can baptize you into Christ even today if that's something that you want to do. If you have further questions or you need the prayers of this church or anything that we can do for you spiritually, then come forward as we stand and sing.